Our sermon passage this morning is from Mark 8, verses 22 through 26. Mark 8, verses 22 through 26. And it's on page 38 in the New Testament, in the Bible in front of you, if you'd like to follow along. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes, Jesus laid his hands on him and said, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go into the village. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Holy God, just like we sung this morning, we pray, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, for we want to see you. Holy Spirit, join us in this moment. Call us deeper into who you are and give us the courage to follow. Amen. So this morning we begin our summer series, uh, Favorite Stories of Jesus. And though it's hard to remember, but a year ago, here's a refresher, I kind of preached on my favorite stories of Jesus. So Jesus calming the storm, Jesus with the woman at the well, Jesus with the bleeding, uh, with the woman with the bleeding disorder, and uh, Jesus feeding the more than 5,000, right? And after that series, I mentioned that this summer, I would preach some of your favorite Jesus stories. And so after asking in Bible studies and one-on-one -on -one, some of you and in congregational meetings, right, we start our summer series of your favorite Bible stories of Jesus, of who you wanted to, what stories you wanted to hear about. And so, and to be fair, sometimes I just said Bible stories and so there was a lot of Old Testament stories thrown into that and I'm not ignoring them. We will get to some of those Old Testament stories because they are also good. But for this summer, we're sticking to kind of the favorite Jesus stories, the ones you wanted to hear about. And so last week, I'm very grateful for Reverend Rodney Sawyer, who was here last Sunday as I was away, and he picked his actually favorite Jesus story. Um, so I guess it actually started last week a little bit. And he picked, right, the calling of the disciples the first time. And he reminded us that following Jesus is not about creating comfortable environments for ourselves, that we need to be on guard for that. Often Jesus comes into those comfortable routines or comfortable spaces that we've created and, and asks us to step out of them. And so in the stepping out in faith, it's, it's when we step out of those comfort zones that we have our eyes open to all that God is doing and, and asking us to join with God in doing it. And so it was a very timely reminder, and it's also a reminder that we also periodically need so we don't forget about our calling, that it's not to make ourselves comfortable, but it's to go where God leads, to love who God loves, and to offer that radical grace of God that we have received from our Savior, to give that to all those that we meet. So this morning, we continue and it's quite an odd story, so thank you for whoever called this one out when I asked about thank you of stories that they wanted to hear about. This healing of a blind man at Bethsaida. And for pastors that use the lectionary text, that three-year rotation, this text never shows up, actually. So often, this text is not preached in churches. And it's left out. And there's, I mean, there's plenty of stories about blind people being healed in scripture. And so maybe they just thought this one, we don't need it because we have so many others. It just gets kind of forgotten. So who knows why it gets overlooked? Maybe just because it's four verses, so it's kind of short. Um, or maybe it's this rare moment when it seems that Jesus's healing didn't quite work the first time. In Mark, Jesus has begun his healing ministry in revealing the kingdom of God to those around him. He's been fulfilling his purpose of coming, of teaching, of healing, forgiving, loving. And before we encounter this story, there have been at least 
15 times where if we read it in Mark, we will find that Jesus has performed some sort of miracle. Some of those moments are just a one sentence description from Mark of, you know, they brought all those that needed healing to Jesus and Jesus healed them. And some of them are fuller stories like Jesus walking on the water or Jesus feeding the more than 5,000 or Jesus healing the man with a shriveled hand on the Sabbath. But in all of those stories, not once does Mark mention that Jesus had to redo the miracle with someone. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 doesn't say that when they were getting low on food or when it seemed like they were running out, they ran back to Jesus and said, here's more bread, you need to do it again, right? Because we, we have more people that we have to feed. The story of the woman with the bleeding disorder isn't that she touched his cloak and nothing happened. And so she had to touch his cloak again. And all the prior healing or miracle stories of Jesus' power, of miracle stories of Jesus, it's his power, his authority, his effectiveness in healing that are marveled at. So what is going on in this story? Is it that this man's blindness was particularly difficult or stubborn and so Jesus needed to have another go at it? Maybe. Some scholars have actually suggested that point and we can't be 100% sure about whether that's right or wrong because Jesus never says anything afterwards. He doesn't comment on it. Though I would suggest that something else is going on with this story. First, we can't forget that Mark, the gospel writer here, loves sandwiches. And I'm not talking about Philly cheesesteaks or turkey clubs or anything like that. I mean story sandwiches. Mark loves putting together stories that are connected and help interpret each other. And so usually the story in the middle is a key to understanding these other stories on each side of it. Our healing story today is the story that's in the middle of chapter 8. And it's meant to help think through what is going on in this chapter. In the beginning of chapter 8, Jesus is again providing a large meal to people. It's the feeding of the 4,000, and only Mark and Matthew have this. They mention that Jesus, after feeding the more than 5,000, that Jesus has been again with a large crowd, healing them, teaching, and also feeding them. And so after this feeding of the 4,000, Jesus is heading out with his disciples and the Pharisees catch him in another village and they come up to him and they want a sign, right? They're trying to figure out who this Jesus is. They're either trying to figure it out or trap him. And so they ask him for a sign and it, and it feels a little ridiculous because, right, some of these Pharisees, they're coming because of all the things they've heard him do. They've heard that he's been healing people. They saw him heal people with shriveled hands. They've heard about the feedings of the 5,000 and the 4,000. Some of them even might have been there. And yet they're seeing all this, but they still don't get it. They're still blind and they say, but we need another miracle from you. Do it now. And so Jesus says, no, he's not going to sit there and perform for the Pharisees. So as they're getting in the boat to go away, they're in the boat and the disciples have just realized that they have only brought one loaf of bread. And so they are talking amongst themselves of like, oh no, we, we didn't bring enough bread. We don't have it. And Jesus turns to them and says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And so the disciples get together and they're like, hmm, he must be saying this because we don't have enough bread, right? Well, how ridiculous does that seem? He just made bread for 4,000 people. But Jesus is trying to tell them, be, take care, discern. There's warning about teachings and, and guidance of other people because if it's not coming from Jesus, it's not leading you to life everlasting. And so when the disciples think he's talking about bread and, and that he must be frustrated and angry with them because they didn't bring enough bread, Jesus looks at this, the disciples and says this question to them. Do you still not see? 
Do you still not understand? Do you have eyes but fail to see? And it's right after this question that the disciples come to Bethsaida with Jesus. And as they come to this place, the people bring out a blind man to Jesus. And they ask him to heal him. And so Jesus brings him away from the village and Jesus spits on his eyes and, and puts his hands on him and says, do you see anything? And I'm not commenting on Jesus' method here because I, it doesn't sa- seem sanitary, but Jesus is Jesus, right? <laughs> so, but at this point, I think it's worth mentioning that we shouldn't forget who Jesus is. That Jesus is a lot of things. He's the Messiah, right? He is God. He He's a teacher, right? They call him rabbi. And if there's anything about teachers, we know they love teaching through relatable things, right? Teach, Jesus uses examples that his disciples and the crowds will understand. He talks about mustard seeds because they know what a mustard seed is. He talks about vineyards because they know what a vineyard is. He talks about shepherds. They know what shepherds are. And so Jesus uses all these examples to help them know who he is, to help them explain, explain what the kingdom of God is. And so in a similar way, in this healing story, it's really an object lesson for his followers. Jesus is using this moment not only to open the man's eyes that has been brought to him, but also to open his disciples' eyes, to get them to see what he's been trying to teach them, what he's been trying to show them. And Mark is very good, I think, in copying copying Jesus' intent. And so he's putting this story right here in the middle to open our eyes also into what's going on. The first attempt at healing leads to some distorted clarity. The blind man isn't completely blind anymore, but he's still not seeing things clearly. He's seeing people, and they they look like trees, right? And so Jesus puts his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes are opened. He sees everything clearly. Our last part of this Mark sandwich comes right after then, this healing. And Jesus is with his disciples. They've walked on, and they're walking to other villages. And as they're walking, Jesus turns to his disciples, and he asks them, Who do people say I am? And the disciples give the most common answers that they, they have been getting. They think Jesus is John the Baptist or Elijah or another prophet. And Jesus says, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter, in one of his shining moments, answers, you are the Messiah. Can you see the transition of sight that is happening with the disciples here? One of the big questions throughout scripture for people and for his disciples, the one they have to discern is, who who is this Jesus? Who's this person? And, And how are we to respond to him? Prior to the healing story, the disciples were worried about bringing enough bread along for the trip. And they had just seen Jesus multiply so much bread and fishes to feed 4,000 people, right? Jesus is worried and concerned about them listening to false prophets and false teachings and asking them to be wary about who their loyalties are lining up with. But the disciples are hung up on bread and blind to what Jesus is saying to them. Can you think of times when the church, or individually, we have been blind and focused on the wrong things when Jesus has been trying to get our attention? I think of all the arguments or rules that have been present throughout the life of the church. So many of them came from initially good places, but still, they put our focus on the wrong things. We kind of miss the point. Can you think of them? Dancing? Movies? What are the other ones? 
We've had this discussion in Bible study. I know you know. (laughs) Cards, right? There's so many we could probably name that the church has kind of gone off track and and said, oh, we're going to we're going to make these rules here. What about some harder ones that get a little more controversial? Baptism. We're going to argue about whether baby baptism or believer baptism. And then we're going to argue about whether you can be sprinkled or if you have to be immersed. Right? And we're going to be over here, and Jesus is going to be like, guys, guys, Savior, right here, follow me. Love God. Love each other. We're like, yeah, 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 Jesus, just a minute. We haven't decided about sprinkling yet or immersion. Right? Good intentions. I'm not belittling baptism. It is so important. But we have allowed so many arguments to separate us out. Because we can't discern this. So now we're going to be different denominations. We're going to go into different groups. We're going to, and Jesus is still over here trying to get our attention. Guys, can you see me? Can you see me? Right? The good news of this story. Because there's always good news with Jesus, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen is that God does not give up on us. God is persistent even when we don't see clearly. Jesus did not leave that blind man only seeing tree-like humans, right? He touched the man's eyes again so he could see clearly. And Jesus did not leave his disciples no matter how many times They got it wrong and were focused on the wrong things. After the moment of some clarity by Peter, you know, naming Jesus as Messiah, we, if we were to continue that story, we know how that story goes, right? Jesus mentions then, oh, he keeps on teaching and says, but I have to die. This is how I'm going to show you I'm the Savior and how I love you. I'm going to have to die. And Peter goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, Jesus, let's not talk that way, right? And Jesus has to tell Peter, no, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about this. You're not seeing it the way that I'm asking you to see it. Jesus did not leave his disciples. No matter how many times they got it wrong, he taught them up until his death. He then died for them. And then he came back and he taught them again what it all meant. And then when he ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. He still did not leave them. He continues to be with us. And for the bride of Christ, the church, for us, this story again opens our eyes so that we see again our Savior who doesn't leave us blind, who doesn't leave us when we get it wrong. For many in the church, right, all the things I've named and many more that I could have named. We sometimes have sorrow, or we should have sorrow. We can lament those moments where our focus has been on the wrong things, when God has been trying to get our attention and we are too busy creating division and separating ourselves out. When we have been blind, when we have been led astray astray by voices that have been trying to pull our loyalties away from Christ, But this story for us this morning is a reminder that God continues to touch our eyes and let us see. That our God, who not only died for the disciples, died for us too. God died for us, Christ died for us, and he will not, if he died for us, he will not walk away from us, right? No, he is faithful. And he is calling us to then let him touch us to open our eyes and walk with him. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the stories of discipleship that show us what having true sight looks like. We pray open our eyes so that we might see you truly. Give us courage to name when we have been blind, 
when we have focused on the wrong things, and give us the strength to ask to be healed. And when we see clearly, may there be no doubt that we turn and follow you. Help us not to hinder all that you are doing in this world, but willingly join in. Lord, receive now the offering of our lives, our time, our labor, and feed us with your grace. We pray this along with the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.